Damn it, cat. <laughs> it's new server day. The only day Rambo gets just as excited as I do. Server room, this is the captain. Rhett, is there something going on down there I need to know about? Ah, we're on UPS backup, sir. The main paradigm couplers have come unaligned. Uh, the tachyon router is uh, tangled with the secondary gazon In router. English, Mr. Rhett? It's the bandwidth, sir. Getting it down is not the problem, it's getting it back up. Well, do what you can, but remember, I've got a budget here. I'm gonna have to call you back. Hosting your own servers also means you get to host all your own problems. Even the most skilled chief engineers will tell you you should decentralize your network. So why not host your services with Linode? If it runs on Linux, it'll run on Linode. They offer shared CPU plans for as little as $5 per month and can scale as high as you need to go with dedicated CPUs, S3 compatible object storage, GPU hosting, NVMe block storage, and more. Linode is also expanding at light speed, with 12 new global data centers planned before the end of 2023. Visit linode.com slash craft computing and get a $100 60-day credit just for signing up for a new account. That's linode.com slash craft computing, and again, thanks to Linode for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So my server rack is again in need of a little bit of an upgrade and a lot of reconfiguration. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Now I had mentioned back in my original Earying Tiger Lake motherboard video that I was planning on using a couple of these in my server rack. And today we're gonna build two of those servers. But what exactly is the overall plan here? Am I just throwing two new servers into the rack? No, we're actually going to do a lot of reconfiguration, including pulling two other servers out and replacing them with these. Now, what exactly I'm replacing might just surprise you. First off, I have my Epic 7601, which used to be my TrueNAS server in my Supermicro 948 chassis. I have since decommissioned all of the disks inside that server, and it's just kind of sitting there running a couple extra VMs that I haven't migrated to another box yet. This is again a 32 core server with 256 gigabytes of memory. So we're definitely going to be taking a step backwards when it comes to multi-threaded performance and memory capacity. But we're going to be stepping up quite a bit in single threaded performance. And I think that's gonna close the gap, especially when it comes to virtualization. The second server we are taking out is my editing NAS server that I built just a couple of months ago using eight Patriot SSDs. While I'm fairly happy with the performance out of that server, I'm not so happy with the power consumption of the dual C602 chipset and the dual 2690V2s that I have installed in there. Last but not least, while I made the move to 100 gig networking this last month, it wasn't without its difficulties and my server in particular that needs attention is Craftinator. While it does have a whole bunch of PCI Express lanes, the particular motherboard in use relegates only X8 lanes on the X16 slots, meaning that both of my NVMe NAS cards and my 100 gig network cards are only running on X8 lanes. And that really doesn't make for the best performance. So it's going to be out with the Epic server, out with the C602, in with two Tiger Lake servers, and then swapping the Cascade Lake server for the Epic 7601, and then migrating all of my services onto the new boxes. Everybody got that? Good, let's get started. So let's start off by building my two new servers. Now again, I'm gonna be using these Erying Micro ATX motherboards, which are socketed, not socketed, soldered with an Intel Tiger Lake 11900H ES or engineering sample CPU. It's eight cores and 16 threads of Intel's mobile architecture. But at just 45 watts, these things are blazing fast. If you want to see what these can do in gaming or workstation tasks, I did a full review and you can check that out right up here. Now there are actually two variants of this motherboard with the CPUs that are installed. There's the 11900H 2.6 gigahertz ES. There's also the 2.2 gigahertz ES. This is the 2.2 gigahertz model. So it's a little bit slower, but it should be still 
well faster than the Epic in single-threaded performance that I'm replacing. Another thing that Earring offers on their website is this heatsink upgrade kit for those who plan on overclocking these boards. The VRM cooling is not what I would call spectacular, although again, at just 45 watts of TDP, it doesn't really have to be. But I figured if I'm gonna go through the trouble of buying and deploying these boards in my server rack, I might as well give the VRMs a fighting chance. As you can see, these are quite a bit thicker and will have a lot more thermal mass, and I figured, hey, why not upgrade it while I'm at it? So the old VRMs are just held on with these pogo pins. So we're gonna remove those. There we go. Out with the old. And in with the new. The new heatsink comes pre-applied with a thermal pad right there. And all that's required is to insulate the rear of the motherboard around the screw holes. And it comes with these little stickers that you uh, stick on the back there to prevent the motherboard or screws from shorting out. Then we're gonna put the new VRM heatsink on there, line it up with the holes, flip it over and screw it in with the sprung screws that were included in the package. And it'll look something like that. For memory, we are going all out with the two DIMM slots that are on this motherboard with two 32 gigabyte, 3600 megahertz DDR4 memory from Patriot Viper. This should be more than adequate to run the VMs that I have without going too crazy. For storage, we're going with a pair of these A60 one terabyte NVMe drives from Silicon Power. These are some of my favorite and least expensive NVMe drives, and I've been using them for a number of years now. If you're a little concerned with longevity, they also have their A80s, which have a little bit more uh, mean time between failure rating and can write some more data. But as I'm running these in a RAID 1, I figured I'd save $20 per drive. And with that all mounted up, there's just one more thing we need to take care of, and that is the cooling. And I can already hear the hate-fueled comments being written in YouTube. Uh, because we're not going with anything exotic or large, because we're putting this inside of a 2U chassis. And seeing as how this CPU only draws between 45 and 60 watts at full tilt, we're just gonna use an Intel box cooler. This motherboard uses a standard 11.5X or LGA1200 mounting profile. So as this cooler is meant to cool about 65 watts, it's perfect, especially considering number one, it was only $11. And number two, my server rack is air conditioned anyway. What we'll be doing is replacing the stock thermal compound that comes on here. And with that, we have one of my two new server motherboards. Now there is one thing that I still use my Epic server for that needs a decent amount of power, and that is virtualized gaming using NVIDIA vGPU. For that, I've been running an NVIDIA Tesla M60, which while it does a fantastic job at 720p and mid-range 1080p gaming, I'm definitely not happy with the power draw, as when it's at full tilt, it'll draw in excess of around 250 watts. For those who watched my previous video on the Tesla P4, you know I'm a huge fan of that small form factor card, especially because it only draws around 70 watts and has more overall horsepower than the Tesla M60 does. But very recently, I got my hands on one of these. This is the Tesla P4, and it is the Turing younger brother to the Pascal P4. This has a full 16 gigabytes of GDDR5, sorry, GDDR6 as well as 2,560 CUDA cores on board, and it still draws just 70 watts. Now, ordinarily, I would make you sit through a full B-roll montage for building the server, but uh, in this case, we'll just go, here's one I prepared earlier. So we've got an Intel Tiger Lake 11900H engineering sample, 64 gigabytes of DDR4 running at 3600 MTS, a Tesla P4 in this server and a Tesla T4 in the one below it, as well as two one terabyte NVMe drives and up front a full six bays of SATA connectivity. The editing NAS that I built just a little while ago, we're gonna be pulling all those drives and putting four each into these boxes as well for full solid state storage. So real quick, I'm gonna slam this other one together and then we'll start juggling.
So one of the questions I get in the comment section quite frequently is how dirty must my servers be because I run them out in my garage? It's actually not that terrible. Uh, this server has been out in my garage for about nine months. We deployed this in what, summer 2022. And uh, that's as bad as it is on like the most dust collected spot. And I haven't cleaned the server since I put it out here. So uh, to answer all your questions, it's not that bad. Well, that was a lot of work. Uh, explaining what I was undertaking on camera and then actually realizing the scale of this upgrade took a couple hours after I finished. I replaced every single server in my rack with something different. Who would win in this battle? A 32 core epic server or two Tiger Lake boys? Need more PCI Express lanes? Out goes the Cascade Lake. And it just so happens I now have a spare epic 32 core board on hand. Why was I still using a dual X79 based 1U server when the drives I was running were just SATA? I could easily move all of that storage to another system with very few drawbacks, all while significantly reducing my power consumption. Before doing all of this migration, I checked the idle power usage on my UPS, and it was hovering right around 660 to 710 watts, dutifully fulfilling all of the roles that I ask of it. Even though I have some of the cheapest power available at just 7.4 cents per kilowatt hour, it still adds up with that kind of a load. After the migrations and all of my VMs and storage were back up and running, we're now idling at around 420 watts. Nice. That's a full 41% reduction in power usage, and that's without factoring in the power savings of running the Tesla M60 at full tilt with multiple vGPU sessions going on. I also realized I didn't fully explain why I swapped out this Cascade Lake motherboard and went with the Epic in Craftinator. I've been using the One U SSD server as a video editing NAS, and maximizing bandwidth and reducing storage latency over spinning rust dramatically improves our workflow. With that server going away, I wanted to run an NVMe SSD array on my primary TrueNAS server. The problem with that quickly became available PCI Express lanes. This Supermicro X11 SPL-F motherboard inside the Craftinator is a fantastic board, but its largest PCI Express slot is only X8, not X16. Now I know there are two X16 length slots on here, but they actually run at X8 speeds. This means my new 100 gigabit network card was only running at a max of 60 gigabit per second, and I would only be able to run a max of two NVMe drives on the other available slot. Short of going with a hardware RAID controller, I needed a new board with at least dual X16 slots. Now, Supermicro does make a Cascade Lake board in this form factor with full-featured PCI Express, but it is a bit outside my price range right now at nearly $650. I'll definitely be on the lookout for one of these on the used market though, as I'd love to get my Optane DIMMs back in use. But right now, the priority is networking and storage. Aside from the power savings, why did I go through all of this upgrading just so I could run all the same services, but with 100 gig networking and NVMe storage on Craftinator? First off, it's fun. Tinkering with hardware is what got me interested in computers in the first place. And anytime I get to tear apart five systems and rebuild them in a single day, means it's a good day. Second, I feel home labbing should be accessible to anyone who wants to get into the hobby. Running servers at your home allows you to run your own cloud services or even internal services to make your life easier and more convenient, but it shouldn't be relegated to only expensive hardware. As my channel has grown and I've collected more higher and higher end hardware, my servers were starting to look more like a medium sized business and not like someone's home server rack that they'd be learning on. 
What better way to return to my roots than swapping out a $3,000 Epic CPU for a pair of Tiger Lake mobile chips? You don't need thousands and dollars of hardware just to get started learning about servers. Heck, my rack has thousands of dollars in just memory and storage alone. Not including the 2.5 inch SSDs and IC.caddies I use, these two U servers I built today, complete with Erying Tiger Lake 8 core CPUs, 64 gigs of memory, dual 1TB NVMe drives, and a Tesla P4, would run you about $600 and change to build today. And for home labs, you could likely find hardware much cheaper on the used market, with things like 1st and 2nd generation Ryzen, along with 8th through 10th gen Intel parts massively dropping in price over the last year. Overall, I am very happy with the results here, and am especially excited to see next month's power bill. I've still got some work to do, like getting vGPU support back up and running on the two Tiger Lake boxes, but every other service is running like nothing ever happened. Plus, I now have my NVMe array and full 100 gig networking on Craftinator. So yeah, today was a pretty good day. If you're interested in any of the hardware that I used in today's video, make sure to check out the affiliate links down in the video description. The cases I used here aren't available anymore, but I linked a very similar model from Rack Choice that still has all the same features, and it's just $100 on Amazon. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Mastodon for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.